So today, we're extremely excited to have Joe Richmond, who is the founder and executive producer of Radio Diaries, which is kind of its own production entity, uh, and the, but the pieces mainly air on different uh, NPR shows. It has, the uh, Radio Diaries has won just about every broadcast award that it can enter, um, and you'll soon sort of see why that is. Um, I mean, the accolades go on and on. Joe's appeared on pretty much every major NPR show and worked on different NPR shows. Um, he's actually been called by the LA Times a, a kind of Studs Terkel of the airwaves. And if you know Studs Terkel, uh, you'll realize that's a very specific and, and really a, a great tribute, I think. Uh, one of the great things about Studs Terkel is the way he could really talk to just about anybody um, and get them, bring the stories uh, out of them. Um, I just kind of uh, grabbed a bunch of reviews and things of the radio show. Not that I'm going to read them all to you, but I found some little phrases and things that seem to, to come up. Um, personal revelations, uh, immediacy of the solitary voice, crackling with passion and truth, eerily intimate, engaging in nuanced portraits, subtle but powerful, intimate, disarming. Um, all of these words that begin to describe the types of stories that Joe finds and produces for, for radio diaries. Um, I teach a class called The Art of Audio Narrative, and many of my audio narrative uh, students are here. Uh, and it, I, I have to say, when we first listen to Joe's work in the class, it's always this eye-opening process. The, I think my, my students learn so much, uh, not just about how, sto how great stories can sound on the radio, which they do sound great, um, but what kinds of stories can be told. I think it, it sort of reminds us of the kinds of voices and the kind of people we can seek out uh, to find really sort of meaningful, legitimate, uh, wonderful, authentic stories from voices we might not have thought about um, before listening to this work. Um, and I also want to say one more thing. I, I bring up, um, I was talking with Joe about this, I brought up his radio diaries with my fiction writing students, just so we, we, we could listen to some of these characters and the way Joe, uh, along, in collaboration often with the subjects of these narratives, develops character. And oftentimes, you'll be one or two minutes into one of these radio pieces, and you will have this incredible experience of this multi-dimensional character. Uh, you feel like you instantly have some knowledge of this person, and you're riveted and just want to sort of follow them through whatever story uh, develops. So um, anyway, that's what I wanted to say. But I really need to sort of get out of here so I can give make room for Joe Richmond. So let's hear it for Joe. Um, should I use this? Okay, I'm going to go and turn it on. I'm a radio professional, so I should know where the on button is. Um, so thank you for all for coming. Um, how many of you are students in radio doing some sort of audio narrative, um, whether it's journalism or, okay, so some of you. And then a bunch of you are not in the college at all. Is that true? Okay, great. All right, it's good to have a mix. Well, I don't know if some of you... Um, those in Ken's class have, have heard some of um, our work, Radio Diaries' work before. Some of you may, may have not. So my plan is um, to play kind of a variety of the kind of stuff that we do, um, uh, produce for, mostly for NPR's All Things Considered, also for This American Life and BBC and for some other programs. And there's kind of a variety of what we do. I'm going to play kind of a, sam a, kind of a sample, a poo-poo platter of, of stuff. But, um, and I'll try to give you some, you know, there's some stuff in, with each story that I can talk about, some of the lessons that I learned along the way and what we were trying to do. Uh, feel free just to jump in with questions. We'll have time for questions at the end, but if you have questions along the way, just jump in. Um, but I, I guess to start, you know, I, uh, trying to think about what is the sort of overarching principle of, or the mission of what we try to do with, with this work. Um, almost all the work that we do, um, doesn't have a scripted narration. The narrator is, is either the diarist that we give tape recorders to and work with them over a long period of time. Sometimes the, the narrator is, is, in a sense, the archival tape when we're doing with his, historical programs. Um, but it's usually the, you know, in the words of the people that we interview and, and that the story is about as much as we can. So the purpose, what we usually try to do is just, um, I mean, I am I'm interested in stories as a listener or reader or watcher in stories that make me feel connected to the subject in some way. So, you know, just not just make download the information, but make me really get it in some deeper emotional way or some, you know, kind of like 
to something in my body or something, not just in my head. And that's, those are the kind of stories that, that we try to do. And I uh, make the argument that radio can do that better than any other medium. And there are a few reasons for that. I think, um, you know, the radio is very good at transporting us to another place, to, not to people, to kind of different lives. And there's this cliche among those of us who produce radio that, um, that the, the pictures are better in radio. And the reason we say that is because they're, you know, they're your pictures, they're the listener's pictures. We, we, you know, you make those own connections. And when you do that, that somehow it kind of, it, it, it's like an adhesive when it, when it's done well. Like I think the story can just kind of sticks in a way that, that some, some of those other media doesn't. Um, radio is obviously very good for characters, just, you know, voices and characters. We feel like we get to know those people. And for me, maybe the most important thing uh, about the kind of radio that we like to do and the kind of radio I like to listen to is stuff, is when I get to experience it myself. So that's mostly what we try to do, this kind of documentary style where, again, I'm not just being told the story, but I get to hear it. I get to kind of live it as much as can be possible along with the subject. So that's sort of the, you know, where we come from. And um, we do kind of two types, types of stories largely. We do diaries where we give people tape recorders and we work with them to do stories about their own lives, turning them into reporters about their own lives. And they record tons and tons of tape and it, it can happen in a couple months or sometimes a year. Sometimes it's taken even longer than a year. And we put that all together as a story about this very kind of personal story, but hopefully it says something much larger. And then we also do a lot of historical documentaries. As I said, with, also without scripted narration, but this kind of collage of voices and archival materials. Those are the two main things we do. And we do sort of portraits as well. So a lot of these stories are long-term projects, but I'm gonna start with something that was actually very quick, a portrait of someone, and it was just a simple matter of spending a day with him. Walter the Seltzer Man. Some of you I think have heard it if you're in Ken's class. And I play this story for a few reasons. One, I, I have kind of a shorter version of it I'm going to play you so I don't, we don't take up too much time. And I brought an outtake that I'm going to share with you as well. Um, but this story for me is really about uh, luck, how important luck is in any kind of documentary journalistic endeavor. You put yourself as much as you can in a position to get lucky and then you just hope to get lucky. And then you have to recognize when you've gotten lucky. So that's, that's what this story says to me. This is um, Walter the Seltzer Man. By the way, um, the screen, I'm gonna, pop, I'm gonna pop in and out of the screen. We couldn't figure out how to mute the screen. So sorry for the, for the um, you're seeing the sausage making. Don't even pay attention. Don't even, don't even look, don't look at the screen. Um, so this is a short version of Walter the Seltzer Man. And um, oh, to set this up. So Walter's grandfather was a seltzer man, his father was a seltzer man, and now Walter is one of the last in New York City of these seltzer men, which basically means he delivers these beautiful bottles of seltzer to people um, in their homes. Uh, the time now is uh, 6.30 in the morning. I'm at 111th Street, right off of Amsterdam Avenue, not far from Broadway. Now, let me start from scratch. My name is Walter the Seltzer Man. This is my truck. It has a little bit of everything. A bunch of old, old bottles, office supplies. I got uh, aspirins in case anyone comes in the truck out of headache. I got flares, digital camera. I have guidebooks, I got tour books. In case I, I'm curious when I'm driving by and I see an old building, I want to know a little bit about the history. Whereas I have a, a truck that's basically extremely chaotic. So anyone else would appear to be a shambles. But to me, it's a... Uh, Semi-organized. Salsa so, man. I have pleasure in my route. I really, it's not just the money. I enjoy the route, I enjoy meeting people, I enjoy the camaraderie, I enjoy the socialism, and I like talking to people. Hey, you are, hello. How you doing? Hey, come get up there, come around. Yes. I got the salsa. Oh, yes. I remember one time, my wife said, look, don't take it seriously. You're a novelty for the minute. You're just a delivery guy. I don't think you're anything more than that. You're like the guy delivering Poland Springs to a water cooler. All right, thank you. Bye-bye. And I said to her, God, I hope not. Seltzer man. Good morning, Walter the Seltzer man. How you doing?
The time is now 2.30 and we're, uh, we're in the Van Cortland Park section of, of the Bronx. We're about to make a, a right turn onto Hillman Avenue, going around the corner from uh, Mrs. Blitz. She's been on my route since before I was born and she was buying stuff for my father then. But parents bought for my grandparents and uh, now they're gone. Mrs. Blitz's husband's gone, my father's gone, and all that's left of this whole story is me and, and Mrs. Blitz. Hello. Oh. oh, don't you look beautiful? You got all dressed up for me? Come in. I have a defective bottle here. When Walter comes in the door on Saturday, we, we just go back over the years. I mean, the seltzer is great, but it's Walter. That's the thing about his product. He's the product. He talks about retiring, I get sick. While we're on the subject, would you like a glass of seltzer? Walter, would you like Yeah, why seltzer? not? I could make you a, with chocolate and milk. It's funny, like, uh, you know, I remember coming here as a kid, I might have been 10 years old, and now I'm almost 50. And Tempest is fugitive, which means time is passing. Well, you knew good. that. Latin, babe, of course it does. You knew that. Time flies. You're not just the seltzer man. You're too bright. When you told me you were leaving law school to work with Al, I was devastated. Well, that's, a, that's the road not so taken. I have so much regard for lawyers. I mean, I, I'd rather take an honest seltzer man any day of the week, but the future for the honest seltzer man is what? Is what? I guess you're right. Seltzer is just a, an anachronistic profession. So I think you're beautiful. Oh, God bless you, baby. You're looking pretty good yourself. <laughs> Took me hours to get to look like this. Drink some more. The time is now uh, 6.30 at night, and uh, it's time to head back home. You know, my whole life was spent doing seltzer. And the funny thing about it is that since I'm the, on one of the last left, as far as the seltzer world is concerned, it's like, to a lot of people, I'm selling memories. And when I come back and I bring the seltzer, it's the same bottles that my father delivered to them, maybe my grandfather delivered to the grandparents. You come to their house, for some reason, for that moment in time, the husband's still there, the kids are still at home, they're young. Somehow, I bring in history. I like being the seltzer man. Um, so that story was part of a series we did many years ago called New York Works, which was uh, portraits of people in vanishing jobs in New York. So there was a knife grinder, there was a um, fisherman, there was one of the guys who makes the water towers, which isn't so disappearing. Um, so that was part of that series. And, and uh, you, I sometimes I play the story for you know radio students and. Again, the thing the thing that I that I think is important about this story is you imagine it's just to imagine it without Mrs. Blitz, basically. You know, it's fine. It's a nice, you know, there's some nice sounds and all that, but it's like that's where the story comes alive. And, you know, I knew about her, you know, the, in preparation for a story for this story or any story, I'm trying to figure out what are the possible moments to get lucky, as I said. And I had no idea she would be so wonderful, but but that's where we got lucky. But um, I brought this outtake because, you know, so the, I guess the the feeling of these stories that we're trying to create sometimes is just like we're just recording life as it happens. Of course, you know that's not true. There's tons of editing and and you know a lot of tape that gets condensed. And um, I thought I would play this because um, it's a reminder about. Um, well, the, let me put it this way. In the back of Walter's old truck, you see all these incredible, if you know what these bottles look like, these uh, old Czechoslovakian blue and green glass, if you've seen them. And, and by the way, Walter is now making more money selling his bottles on eBay than he is in his route. So that gives you a sense. These beautiful bottles and his truck, this old beaten down truck with these bottles lined up and the sun's coming in. And I thought like, this is the beginning of the story. Just like, we're gonna place it right here. So I tried to get that, and as you, as you, you heard in the story, that's not the beginning of the story. Um, I couldn't get it, and this is, this is me trying to get it. 
again, before we leave the back of the truck, just describe. You know, just to get a picture of it. Just quickly. Cut it, because we got to go a bit. We'll do it later. We'll do it later. Uh, we, just quickly, just two seconds, just describe. Okay, here we are. How many seltzer bottles are here? Just, like, describe it quickly. No story, just, like, describe Well, I'll describe it. So anyhow, when I when I uh, no, no no not a story. Just say here we are, and as you can see, you know that kind of. Thing. I got it. I can't do anything about the story if you know that already. So anyway, when uh, when my vehicle was stolen, fortunately I had this other one that I was able to use, and what I did. No, Walter, no, because we gotta go. We don't need the story. Just just say okay, we're in the back of the truck. You do need the story. I'm like there's. I gotta tell a story. I can't talk. I know. <laughs> I have to tell a story. And I'm waking up, so it's gonna get worse. I know, but I just, but I just got to get the picture of it. You know, for people on the radio who can't see it, they want to know. Okay, we're in the back of the truck. We've got how many seltzer bottles here? The green, blue, just like a, a visual picture. That's that's what I want. Let me do the next two stops, and I'll describe. We'll go back in here because I really want to. I don't want to get banged up Broadway. Okay, but we're, but we're here, and, and it just right. take a second. All right. So anyhow, when when uh, I, I I realized that I, I would never get my my uh, oh, that's soda. Okay. We, don't, we don't need the story. That's yeah, but I need the story. All right, we'll do it later. Just, just to pull back the veil a little bit, that's how these stories get made. Yeah. Um, okay. So anyway, that, that was a pretty, uh, that's a, a quick story for us. It's basically a day in the life. Uh, with the diaries, it's a whole different thing. We're giving people tape recorders, and working with them for a long period of time. And I thought I would, um, I've got two short samples of diaries. I thought I would play the first one I ever did way back in 1996 um, because it was a big lesson for me just in sort of how what is the, the powerful tape in this, these kind of stories. And I also have something that, um, that we're working on right now that hasn't aired. So this is a story about Amanda who when I met her had recently come out to her parents as gay. Her parents, um, Catholic, conservative, having a really hard time with it. And Amanda took her tape recorder to, you know, to school, driving around with friends, talking to a girlfriend on the phone, all sorts of things. And of course, you know, the real bleeding heart center of the story was um, when she talked to her parents. So that's a little, there's a little clip from that. My parents, my parents know that I'm, that I'm bisexual, but they don't talk about it much. You know, my father, my father doesn't really talk much at all. My mother, on the other hand, when, we, when I first told her, and uh, she reacted totally crazy. I was all against my growing up beliefs. Anyone who was gay or was lesbian was considered Sick. Sick. Wasn't accepted in the Catholic Church at all. It just it wasn't accepted. So I've grown up with that concept all my life. So to hear that you're that you wouldn't that blow your mind? How do you feel about it, Dad? About what? How do you feel about me? Fine. What about it? Sexuality wise. Oh, you're you're 17 years old. You're you're not definite. You're not formed in your ways. Someone at 17 does not know what is at the other end of the line. Anybody? How do you know? <laughs> There's just not enough life that you've seen. You haven't seen enough. You haven't done enough. You have not lived. Well, over two years and then uh, five months have gone by, and I that's think what I believe. I think if a good fella came by and really treated you right, your mind will switch. My mind will switch. So it's, it's all in my mind. It is. It's all in your mind right now. You well, just don't say, well, this is how I feel, and this is how I'm going to be for the rest of my life. I'm not saying that's how I'm going to be for the rest of my life, and I'm not saying that I'm not going to have sex with a guy. I'm saying that I do. I want to go and have sex with a guy. It's not happened yet. I hope not. No, it's not. But I, I mean, I'm going to. I'm not going to like deny myself of well, that. Well, that's what I said. Don't deny yourself of that. <laughs> and you may find, when you do that, that your whole outlook may change. <laughs> it's just not like, oh, this is somebody's decision. This, they don't really know what they want right now. There's guy. I mean, I've been out with guys while I've been going out with Dawn. Dawn's been out with guys while she's been going out with me. I mean, we, we're so like we're really close. And there's like a love there, more for me towards her than her towards me, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But we're with each other, you know? Well, maybe that's just a good friendship. You love friends. 
Yeah, but I don't do what I do with Dawn with friends. Do you know what I mean? You don't do what you do with dad with friends. Okay, and that's Amanda. Um, I'm sure you all have a similar experience listening to that. This is from 96, and we went back uh, a few years ago to five of the original Teenage Diarists and did news stories with them as adults in their 30s. Um, Amanda was one of them. And, you know, it's, it's such a timepiece in terms of how the world has changed. Um, that, that's, that's what I hear when I hear that story, or, and how her family has changed, too. I mean, her mother now counsels other parents whose kids are coming out and things like that. So um, it's, it's, that story is interesting to me just to see, like, it's not just that she, you know, and a lot of the other diarists that we went back to um, 16 years later, they had changed so much. With Amanda, kind of the world had changed. You had a question? Um, did her parents know that she was recording them? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. And with all the teenage stories, obviously the parents are involved in part of it, um, both in, in the story, but all, you know, in terms of permission and consent. Yeah, um, and uh, that, you know, that's I think uh, after that story aired, it was sort of in the in the years after that story aired that I came to appreciate how brave her parents were just to be part of that story. You know, just to put themselves out there too. Um, basically, the only rule that. Amanda and her parents had in term, when that story aired was that her grandmother could never know about it because her grandmother would have died if she her granddaughter was gay. That's that was what she felt, and um, and her grandmother wasn't a public radio listener. So, yeah. um, other question before I move on. So um, yeah, so Amanda did a, a follow up story, interviewed her parents again in that same room. Um, the funny thing about that follow-up interview was that the dad talked most of the time, so <laughs> that also changed. Um, yes, yeah, so that was Amanda. We also followed up with um, with four other diarists. Uh, if maybe some of you have heard some of the original or the or the revisited stories, but uh, Juan, who was an who was an undocumented immigrant as a teenager from Mexico, and um, 16 years later has this wonderful kind of middle class life with. You know, three kids and two cars and a good job, but he's still undocumented after all that time. Uh, Frankie, who was kind of a football star in Alabama at his high school and got involved very sadly with um, with crystal meth and really went really downhill, and his diaries kind of putting his life back together. And uh, Josh, who uh, with Tourette syndrome, um, who did a, a story and kind of a, a, did another story um, 16 years later about still living with Tourette's and other challenges that he had. And Melissa, the teen mom, who her son now uh, is a teenager himself when she does her, her grown-up diary. <laughs> so when we did that series on NPR, this kind of Teenage Diaries Revisited, Teenage Diaries Then and Now, we also did a contest on the air to find a new teenage diarist and kind of cast the net wider. And one of the we did it with a site called Cowbird, this storytelling site. Maybe some of you have heard of it. And through that site, we got this connected with this wonderful uh, girl in Saudi Arabia that we've been working with for the past year. And mostly remotely, we only met her once, and we're working with Skype, and it's just you know this whole kind of new way of working with her. But she's been recording a diary about being a young girl in Saudi Arabia and being you know and getting marriage proposals and trying to figure out what she wants and when and all that sort of stuff. This, um, this is raw, but I just thought it would be fun to play something that, um, that we're in the middle of working on. So this is just a three minutes of um, a conversation that she has with her brother. What do you want me to do in the future? You? Yes, me. To be a great uh, mom and um, to have a great uh, husband. Yep, yep. So when do you think I should get married? You should get married now. Now? <laughs> you you are capable of getting married, so you should get married now, yeah. I will, uh, inshallah, I will be capable in three or four years as no, well. No, 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 you are now capable. Yes, and I was capable last year too. Yes, yeah, so you, miss, you are missing a lot of uh, great opportunities. Actually, I think I will miss great opportunities if I do get married. I feel like if I get married, I have to be responsible towards my husband. And so that would stop me from doing the things I want to do. Being responsible for your husband is, is just very marvelous that you cannot, you, cannot, <laughs> you will forget everything else. 
<laughs> okay, wow. <laughs> We're moving on. Um, uh, do you have any questions for me? Yeah. Go ahead. When you will start to cover yourself properly? Uh, I think I am covering myself properly, actually. So sometimes it's you're covering your face, sometimes uh, not covering, sometimes... So it's a bit like hypocrisy or... No, it's not. I usually cover my face. I cover my face when I feel like my face is... It, it looks... I don't know. Like, it draws attention. That's when I cover it. So... It's subjective. Yes. Like when I, feel, uh, when I have makeup on or when I'm going out and there are a lot of men in the place I, uh, where I'm going, I cover my face. But sometimes it's not needed. Like I'm in the car, for example, or, or like I'm in the restaurant where I have to eat. You know, what's the problem with that? Not what I think, what the Prophet <laughs> and what the Quran tell you to do and to cover. We, we both know there are a lot of opinions on this by the scholars, so you can't just say something and say that it's the, the only way. Anyway, thank you very much for this interview. Um, do you have anything, any last things to add? Um, there is, uh, to conclude, I would like to say that um, uh, I have some suspicious about the recordings that's going on, <laughs> where this would go. So, yeah, it should be in safe hands. It will be. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much. And goodbye. You know, I, I think the, the goal of this kind of way of working and these kind of stories is when you can take something that people have kind of, you know, have in mind statistics or stereotypical views about or kind of two-dimensional kind of a picture of and blow it up with this real human being. And I just love her, just um, I really, I think she's a great character, just someone who feels like a relatable kind of American teenager or whatever in the full hijab and in Saudi Arabia and dealing with these things. So that's a story that we're working on now that will air on NPR um, sometime probably this winter. <coughs> um, I'm gonna move to something totally different, but any questions before I do? Okay. Yeah. You made a reference about you know putting the net out. How do you find these people? Mm. You know, uh, sometimes just like a good character, you find through a reference or stumbling in some sort of way. But usually, it's looking. It's like a anything I would do as a as a journalist, as a reporter. I'm looking, thinking about a particular kind of story, like an undocumented immigrant, for example, and. With Juan, I just chose Laredo, Texas, because I had a connection there, and just call after call after call, looking for teenagers who had come over recently, whose, Amer whose English was good enough. You know, I interviewed a bunch on the phone, found, I really liked him, went down and met him. You know, so it's just sort of like a, it's a casting, you're casting your story, like I would as a reporter, in a sense. Um, so usually it works that way. What's a good story to kind of tell in this way? But sometimes it works just like, stumbling on a good character, and that was Maj's case. Maj is her name. Um, I never imagined doing a story about a teenager in Saudi Arabia. It just happened. She kind of won our contest. <laughs> um, yeah, so it goes both ways. But you know, in, I mean, in all stories, but particularly in radio, it's all about the characters. You know, it's just, it, you know, the, the quality you get in their voice, the kind of, authenticity and honesty and just the way that they pop out of the of the the radio or the speaker all that sort of thing and they can and i always say that you know th there are different ways that people are good characters i think when i first started doing radio and first started doing the diaries i thought that a good diarists were like the uh the funny extroverted performy ones um and so much of the time it's those i call them they're the talk outers and the talk inners you know, the ones who kind of make you come to them. They're kind of like quiet and a little bit, and you may, you know, you, you kind of have to work to get to them. Um, you know, so people are good at, um, you know, so that intimacy is obviously incredibly important. And with the diarist, people are good at, some people are good at just sitting down the, on their bed late at night, confessional. Some people are good at thinking like a radio producer and recording all the sounds. Some people are good at anecdotes, you know. So it, it, um, some people are brave with interviewing their mom. 
So partly it's sort of, you know, what are they good at? And then also pushing them in ways that they're not. But the lesson that I learned with that very first diary with Amanda, which you can hear is the heart of the story are, is usually conversations. Often teenager parent, in this case, brother, sister. But those conversations so much of the time is where like the real, you know, the real center of the story is. So other than diaries, we do a lot of historical documentaries. And the biggest series that we did, probably my favorite project in a lot of ways, um, we did the, I, I was, lived in South Africa for a few years, and I did this, um, my wife and I collaborated on a history of apartheid called Mandela and Audio History, about Nelson Mandela and the whole history of apartheid. Five part series that um, aired on NPR and is also aired on BBC and many other places. And the part I'm gonna play, so, so there are a lot of reasons I love doing this story. It was you know, being able to interview all these people. It was 10 years after the um, Mandela's election, so it was sort of the limelight had gone away, but it was still very fresh and visceral in people's minds when we were interviewing people. Um, but I got to spend tons of time in, our, in archives. And the great thing about audio archives is that you know, the video archives get mined pretty thoroughly, but audio archives get often forgotten, and there's so much great amazing material, and especially in South Africa at that time, they were still going through all the stuff that had basically either been, you know, almost destroyed or miscatalogued or put in boxes during the apartheid years, and they were just kind of combing through all this stuff. And I spent like, uh, I spent weeks in the basement of the SABC archive, the public broadcaster in South Africa, going through these tapes and finding some tapes that no one, you know, didn't have anything written on them. One of them was um, the prosecutor, a tape of the, uh, the prosecutor from Mandela's Ravonia trial, which is the trial that sent him to prison for 27 years. And I'm playing this, I'm gonna play you the scene that we created for the documentary, but first I'm gonna play you just a little 15 second clip um, from that archival material. And I'll tell you why in a sec. Firstly, the state alleges the plan purpose of was to bring about chaos, disorder, and turmoil in the battle to be waged against the white man in this country. So that, that tape, by the way, that really it came from a reel-to-reel -reel tape that when I put it on the player, it was like falling apart and coming on. And I had to get splicing tape and razor blades and actually splice it back together, this tape of, 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 of the, you know, inside the, the actual court proceedings of his trial. But the thing that was so important in that tape, which maybe I'm just going to play the first two seconds again, just listen. That cough, like I, I remember listening to this stuff and hearing the great, you know, so much of what gets saved are just the... Um, the perfect moments of the speech and you know the kind of the the produced moments in a sense but when you get this raw tape and you hear the cough and you hear the space i don't know if you got this sense but you kind of you're you're there in a different way you can kind of hear the dimensions of the room and you can kind of you feel it in a different way so those kind of elements in archival material is rare and wonderful so when i heard that cough i was like yes um, here's the scene and I think I used the cough twice in this scene. <laughs> I can't remember. Listen for it. You can. Um, and this is, so this is the scene from the chapter, again, this five-part series about Mandela and the history of apartheid. This is um, the Ravonia trial leading up to his imprisonment. A remarkable demonstration by a crowd of several hundred outside the courthouse in Pretoria. Nelson Mandela, his wife, okay. was okay. saw, accused with the others of plotting sabotage to overthrow the South African <coughs> government by force. From day one of our arrest, the police trumped it into his, you are going to die. You are going to hang. And that remained their attitude right through the trial. <coughs> Firstly, the state alleges the planned purpose thereof was to bring about chaos, disorder and turmoil in the battle to be waged against the white man in this country. We knew that there was no hope of getting an acquittal. The question was, what do we do with the trial? They all got a shock when our lawyers announced that Mandela will not give evidence, but he'll make a statement from the top. He stood up and he proceeded to deliver the speech. I have dedicated my life to this struggle. 
and I knew he was going to say, in effect, hang me if you dare to, Mr. Judge. But only when he said it. It is on a day for which I hope to live but my Lord. If it need be, it is on a day for which I am prepared to die. It was terrible. <coughs> Nobody said anything. Even the judge didn't know what to say. I knew it was a moment of history. He emerged then as a great leader. As we have been thrown uh, to Vladimir, one tried to accept the reality that we may in fact spend years <coughs> in prison. But we believe very strongly that we would not die in jail. We would return. And that, uh, we stayed there for 27 years. The other, the other thing about the COP is, I, and those of you in Ken's class, I think, read a, an article about the significance of coughs. So, <laughs> mul multiple meanings of every cough. Um, let me check in on timing, because I was going to do the Willie McGee, but I might skip that and go to this last piece and then do questions. And then if there's more time, we could kind of circle back to it. We, we want to... Um, yeah, let me... Let me let me um, let me skip that one. If we have time, we'll go back. So this next story that I want to play, this will be a little bit of a longer um, segment. Is it, this is a story that um, my wife is a photographer, and she was um, photographing women boxers leading up to the 2012 Olympics when when, when boxing, women boxing was going to be in the Olympics for the very first time. She was photographing these women boxers at these tournaments around around the country. And she met this uh, teenager, teen boxer, who no one knew about because she was in the youth circuit uh, up until this time. But she was competing to try to make the Olympic team. And soon my wife saw her. Everyone else watched her for this first match. And she just looked amazing. And my wife kind of interviewed her and said, we've got to do a story about her. And I, was, I said for about a week, I said no, because we were, I was in the middle of all these other things. And I just kind of didn't want to drop everything. Um, Ultimately, we did drop everything, and we followed Clarissa for the uh, month leading up to the Olympic trials, where she ended up making the Olympic team. So we did a diary with her, sort of a part diary, part, you know, there were a lot of times where actually I was holding the tape recorder, the microphone instead of, she was, in the boxing ring for one. And um, so this is the story that aired on NPR leading up, or just after the Olympic trials when she had made the team. And I'm just going to play kind of a section here. I'll play this one. I'm trying to think of anything I need to say. No, this is some um, kind of a couple different little scenes put together, so you get a sense of the story was about eighteen. The story is about eighteen minutes long as it ran on NPR. This is about five and a half minutes. What's up, champ? We're at my dad's house, and we're about to watch the DVD of me boxing. I think I got about eight now on DVD. And um, he gonna talk trash. Watch how you gonna come out now. Oh, oh, oh okay. <laughs> oh. You see, with no jab, yeah. no action. You see how she was wasting punches? Yeah, she wasted energy. Stop For those who didn't know, my dad was a boxer. They said he was real good. They used to call him Cannonball. I had a career as a underground fighter. We go from state to state here and there fighting guys. I fought in barns closed army bunkers. You understand what I'm saying? You know, we was dirty fighters, you know? You fought until one of y'all couldn't stand no more. You it's, know what I'm like? It's illegal. Oh, it's yeah, totally it's... illegal. You know, uh, I one time could have turned pro, I think, but I started winding up in and out of prison. And when I came home from prison, that was the first time I seen you since you was two. Yeah, you had braids in your hair? Mm -hmm. That's what I remember. Yes. My dad, he went to prison when I was two and got out when I was nine. You remember the first conversation we ever had about boxing? Yeah. One day we was riding in my van, I think it was, and we was kicking it. Mm 
I told a story about the fact that I used to fight and that none of my children or no one else in my family had picked up the torch and became a boxer. So I was like, okay, maybe you can kind of like live your dream through me a little bit. And about a week later, you know, you asked me, could you box? And my answer was, hell no. Do you remember the exact words that, that you said? You said boxing is a man's sport. That made me so, it made me so mad. And you should have took it that way. That was a <laughs> chauvinist statement that a girl can't do it. So, you know, you, you was right. And I've been at it ever since. I'm still proving people wrong. Truth be known, I just think, little mama, you are awesome. Hello, this is Clarissa again. I'm at Burston Field House right now. And it is 17 days before the Olympic trials. Get ready, Russ. Hurry up. Okay, hold on. Coach, can you explain to me what's going on right now, uh, Mr. Jason Crutchfield? Coach Crutchfield. You're going to spar with them two guys right there. Come on, y'all. Get ready. Ready. Bye. Good shot. Let him go. Right there, Rim. There you go. Let it go right there. To me, the gym was a beautiful place. You know, as soon as I walk in there, it's like right there, all stress just, it, just, right it just leaves you. If they would let me live there, I would. I mean, we got a bathroom upstairs for showers. I bring my clothes, pillow, a nice size cover. Probably make me a pallet in the ring. Cut the light off and then just go to sleep. That's a good shot there. Come on, ref. Let's go. Stay into it. Sloppy, sloppy. Don't get sloppy. Keep yourself together. There you go. Well, I can remember her dad brought her down to the gym. She was 11 years old. Come on. 11. And he told, he told me, he asked me, he said, hey, um, my daughter won a box. A week after that, I noticed how she was punching aggressive and fast and her fire, her hunger. Man. A coach always wants a champion. That's why we coach. We want to help the kids and stuff like that, but the first thing is to have a champion. Now look, I think I got one. <laughs> I just never thought it was going to be a girl. All right, come here, Russ. You got to do 15 minutes of ice, 15 minutes of heat. You got me? Hello. <laughs> hey, Russ, turn that phone off. I'm quite better, okay? All right. Who is this boy? Uh. What? What did you do? I mean, ain't no big deal. Dang. So you rather talk to the boy than be at the Olympic trials? Come on, man. Huh? What kind of question is that? You know how close this thing is? Mm-hmm. Real close. You don't need anything that's gonna take your attention somewhere else. Nothing. Whatever. I like boys. Can't help it. That's cool, but just keep it platonic. What that mean? Nothing but a friendship. If you like him, drop him. Me? Ooh, nothing. Russ, you're up against a lot. When we go to these Olympic trials, you're going to be up against grown women that are stronger than you. They ain't got to go to school. They ain't got homework. All they got to do is box. These people are hungry. Mm, it makes sense. You're gifted. You're real good. But you're not ready yet. We're almost there. We're not there yet. Well, I'm strong-minded. I'm not going to let nobody feed me off in the wrong direction. Ressa, look at me. Just stay focused. You got all your life for boys. This is a once-in-a-lifetime thing right here. Marissa T-Rex Shields, and I was going to show you. So she went on. So she went on to make the Olympic team, and then my wife continued to follow her uh, photographing and also with these two documentary filmmakers up to the Olympics, where uh, she went on to win the gold medal. And I just have this. This makes me so happy, this little thing. Here, I'm going to show you this. <laughs> just a, <laughs> I could watch that for like an hour. <laughs> 
Yeah, so she was uh, among, you know, she made history of one of the first women to win a gold medal, to win any medal. She was the only, um, the only gold medal on, on the US boxing team, men or women. So she, uh, the film that they're making is a documentary that's going to come out uh, before the next, before, uh, before this summer's Olympics in Brazil. And it follows her to the gold medal and also back to Flint, Michigan. I forgot to mention she's from, she's from Flint, Michigan. Pretty, pretty rough childhood. You know, she, at the time that we're doing the story, she's floating between different places to stay, not staying with her mom. Her mom's pretty messed up and um, living in auntie's houses and, and so on. So um, the story tracks her up to the Olympics and then back to Flint, Michigan, where, you know, everything will be fine now that she's won the gold medal, but, you know, the sponsorships don't come, the endorsements don't come, and sort of life remains somewhat the same. That's sort of the documentary. So, um, so that's what I've got. We, I've got some other thing I can play if we have time, but I think let's open it up to questions and see where we are. Yeah. Um, because so much of your work is publicly funded, like the PR and the BBC, you've been doing it long enough to see the ups and downs of that funding. And obviously things like travel have costs associated with it. How does changes in public funding affect your work? Uh, hugely. I mean, the funding is a huge thing. And, you know, I think what the real change in funding, this may be getting into sort of inside baseball a little bit too much for some people, but one of the interesting, we're a nonprofit and we're funded by foundations and some individual donors, that sort of thing, government grants, foundation grants. And the biggest thing is um, just what's happened to the media world in general is that everyone is so scared and so uncertain about what's happening that um, very few, fewer places are funding content. That's basically what it is. People are looking to, foundations are looking more to fund what are the new experiments that are gonna cure the, the problem um, and, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, so it's sort of easier to get that kind of money than it is just to get money for, for content and stories. That's sort of what, what we go up, you know, are up against. But on the other hand, you know, of course, the podcast world is has been great as well for us, partly because now we're in this world where we can get sponsorships too on the podcast. But even more than that, for us, it's a way to give our old stories new life. I mean, that's been the most wonderful thing to be able to take some older stories, some of the older diaries, go back, interview them again, what's happened in their lives since, or freshen up an old story with new information and then put it on the podcast. And most of the podcast listeners didn't hear it the first time on NPR four years earlier. And, um, and we can also respond in different ways. We did a story um, for NPR about four years ago about um, a lynching that happened in Marion, Indiana in the 30s that ended up being the inspiration for the song Strange Fruit that Billie Holiday made famous. And it was... Um, and what's interesting about that lynching on that day is that two young bo black boys were lynched, a third wasn't. And he, he survived. He believed to be the only African American to ever survive a lynching. We did a story about that that aired on NPR a while ago. And then we put it on the podcast in the sort of wake of Ferguson. And it just like, shh, all of a sudden, there was this whole new frame for it and a whole new interest. And so that's one thing that's nice about the podcast, too. There's actually a, a, a new haven artist that survived a lynching. Mm -hmm. Really? Yeah. New Haven artist that he's a folk artist. Mm -hmm. um, lives in New Haven. Mm -hmm. Wow, what's that story? Some of you know that story? Yeah? A New Haven artist that survived a lynching. What, from when? How long ago? Um, oh, it was in the 20th. No. Mm -hmm. Not not He's that not that old. He's still alive. Uh -huh. yeah. uh, his name is Winfred Rapper. Yeah, I couldn't. Oh. I'd love to find out about that. Okay, good. All right. Thank you. Thank you all. Crowdsourcing may possibly a new story. Uh, he's been interviewed a bunch of times, or has he been? Uh, I don't know. I don't he's an artist. He does um, work on leather. He tools leather and paints it. He colors it. And, and his paintings are autobiographical. Mm -hmm. So. I don't think he has been interviewed a lot, I think, but he gets his story out by drawing it, and it's uh, like, uh, uh, it, it, it's real folk art. It's right. the, the very nice, very nice. Uh, I would love to kind of, we could have a whole series of the Chiefs from our first Sorry to joke about that. <laughs>
Um, in the same way, has there been a, sort of a back and forth flow of somebody hears something you're doing and, and has to write about it, or you read something and then need to hear the voices? Yeah, you mean between like print and radio? Yeah, it, it definitely. I mean, you know, there are so many stories that you could read and just hear how it could be so completely different. Um, you know, some stories obviously lend themselves to different forms, but um, but yeah, it happens a lot where you'll read. You know, obviously the coverage in print is so wide that a lot of people will steal stories from print, but um they become such different stories most of the time. Does it work the other way? You know, I think so, but less so, just because the print world is so huge and audio world less. Yeah. Uh, how often do you have to like scrap a diary if you can't find the right story? Usually we, you know, just because we're a small operation and we kind of, usually we see them through, but definitely there have been some that haven't worked out. Um, Partly because they, you know, they've lost interest. The story hasn't turned out to be as good. So yeah, that does happen. I did. I gave a tape recorder to this pair of teen runaways once, and they ran away with a tape recorder. So, <laughs> so they, it happened. They, there, there are different ways where it doesn't work out. Um, but for the most part, you know, like uh, even a sort of mediocre story with enough time and enough kind of crafting, and you know, going from forty hours of tape to choosing the right. 20 minutes of tape, uh, you can make a, a good story. A uh, personal question in how you came to this. The few moments before you weren't in it at all, and the next morning when you woke up and you were in with both feet, what? Uh, in terms of radio? Well, in terms of the motivation that put you into this. Well, I, um, well, I was doing radio in college. I went to college with my friend, with my friend Danny. We went to college together, actually, Oberlin College in Ohio. Um, and uh, so I was doing radio in college, music and some news stuff. But I, I, I actually thought early on that I wanted to do film documentaries. That's what I, I guess that's what I knew. I, you know, things like like Eyes on the Prize, I, I had seen, and you know, and there were other influences, Studs Terkel's working, and some other things. So, like I knew I wanted to do some sort of oral history documentary thing. Um, but I didn't know what that was. And then out of college, I started interning at the place that made Eyes on the Prize and also doing radio <clears throat> to do news. But I just didn't know there was such a thing as radio documentary then. And I started to hear it. And I also had this thing where I was working sort of on the periphery of doc film documentary and doing radio where I could just take my tape recorder and go and interview someone. And I was like, whoa, I don't need to ask anyone. It doesn't cost so much. I can just go and talk to people and they will talk to me. And that was just like, wow. I mean, people will tell you their stories and you can, you know, it was a, this passport. So that was the revelation for me of like, I can just go out and do this by myself and, and decide. And so I, but it was a while before I started doing, I was doing more news and news features for a while and working as a producer at NPR. <clears throat> and then it was in 96 where I started doing the Teenage Diary series and doing more long form. So it was a mar marathon, it wasn't overnight. It was a creep, yeah. It was a slow, <laughs> slow. Um, there were probably little revelations along the way, but it wasn't a wake up in the morning. Yeah, yeah. Um, the closest was, some of you may have heard um, this documentary called Ghetto Life 101, if you're longtime NPR listeners. So Dave Isay, who now does StoryCorps, which maybe some of you are familiar with, he did this documentary many years ago where he gave tape recorders to two um, young kids in the housing projects in Chicago. And I remember talking to them, talking to Dave as he was working on that. And that was, my, that was a revelation for me. And it was, obviously it was an idea I directly stole. Um, and... <laughs> Because I, you know, I had loved, maybe some of you know the 28 Up series, the 35 Up series, and this idea of following people over time. And that was the closest thing to a lightning bolt, was talking to him and being able to adopt his idea. Which, you know, people had done in film and even in radio, giving people tape recorders. Nothing was new, of course. But for me, that was, uh, yeah. Was that uh, piece with the Chicago um, young students was that done into a video as well? I don't think so. They did a follow-up story on NPR like a year or two later. 
Um, that was a little bit different, but I don't think it was a video. But it got a lot of attention at the time, so it may have been covered on TV. Do you know? Was there a video? I haven't heard of Elm. I know the follow-up, though. Yeah. Can I ask you to that? Um, now you've moved from tape for the radio diarists to <clears throat> digital recorders. Um, for the tape stuff, do the, who keeps all the, I mean, if you have 40 hours of tape on one of these people, is that just stuff that you have in your archive? Do the diarists themselves ever, like, I mean, it must be interesting to have 40 hours of recordings. You have the 20 minute piece, but like, do the, the, the diarists ever want to like go through and mine the hours and hours? That's a really interesting question. No, not yet. Really? Not yet. Um, no, I, with Melissa, the, the way the Revisited series happened was that Melissa, the teen mom, I had lost touch with for many years. It's sort of, it, because I mean, she disappeared and, you know, she's from New Haven, by the way. She's from New Haven. So I spent a lot of time in New Haven back in the mid, late 90s. I was working with her and after her kid was born, uh, she disappeared. Her, turned out her child was very sick and she just disappeared. So I, she got in touch with me like 10 years later. I've been out of touch with her for 10 years. And through that, I I started. I met up with her and interviewed her and trying to, you know, what is what's happened in your life since, and that's what sparked this idea of revisiting a f other diarist too. But for her, part of what's what's in her revisited story is playing parts of her old diary, the birth scene for one, for her son. You know, and so there is this like time capsule. She's playing for her son the sounds of him. You know. She recorded an hour after she gave birth, like the cries and all that. That's a good diarist, by the way. <laughs> in the hospital, brought the tape recorder, turned it on. <laughs> um, so yeah, so that was a that was a big scene uh, where he's listening to himself as a baby. Yeah. So yeah, there is this like life. None of them ever asked to hear the raw tape. I've got all the raw tape, of course, but you know, the, uh, part of it is like. When I was doing this in the mid 90s, the Teenage Diary series, I was a lot younger. I didn't have kids. I had all the time in the world. It's a bit of a different process then, too, and I could just spend so much time. Now, doing the Revisited series was partly my own reflection of like, life is just too busy now. Like, there's no time for any of this stuff. So, you know, that's what I think about when I think about all that raw tape. Would I ever go back to it? I'd love to think I would, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Um, yeah.